Is Kingdom Hearts 1 just too easy for you? Are you tired of getting smacked by fleshy entities of darkness over and over and it barely puts a dent into your HP bar? When you booted up the game, you had three options and you thought, well, this one's named after the best of the seven sins, so you went with that, but it's still just not challenging enough. Have no fear. Actually, have a lot of fear. I'm not afraid of the darkness. No, you should be, Riku, for with the press of a button, you can stunt your growth and subject yourself to a whole new world of pain. It's like a magic carpet ride for masochists. You've probably heard of the level 1 run, and maybe you've even tried it yourself. For the uninitiated, ever since Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, most Kingdom Hearts games have given the player the option to equip an ability that prevents them from gaining experience. This ability is known as EXP 0, 0 EXP, or no experience because consistency is for lamers. The ability didn't exist in the original releases of Kingdom Hearts 1, but ever since the game was re-released on the 1.5 Remix for PS3, the ability has been available by default when you start the game on Proud Mode. Now, you can turn this ability on whenever you want, but for a real challenge, you can flick the switch while Sora is still level 1 during his dive to the heart, and you can play the whole game as a frail child who will be knocked over by a slight draft. Win. Of the main three games, I feel like the KH1 level 1 run is probably given the least attention. I don't have any specific info to back this up, but I feel like it may be because KH2 and 3 are a bit more accommodating to players who choose to take on the challenge. The level 1 run was possibly more front of mind for the developers when making 2 and 3, whereas in 1 the ability was added in retroactively. However, KH1 will still bend the rules of the game a bit in order to keep the experience from being utterly miserable, like making Sora deal a reasonable amount of damage to bosses even at level 1 so that those fights don't take an eternity. Regardless, the level 1 run is no easy task, and I would recommend playing the game a few times normally before subjecting yourself to it, but for those of you who are ready for the challenge or already making your way through it, I've decided to put together a guide all within one video that covers all of the major encounters you'll face throughout your journey. We'll go from start to finish, and I'm going to cover every scripted encounter, including optional bosses, as well as anything in between that may give players some trouble. I'll have timestamps in the description for all of the major encounters, and for the sake of time, we're going to jump from battle to battle, so I won't waste your time or mine by walking through all of the normal stuff that you'll be doing on a regular playthrough. I should note that I am by no means an expert of this run. I first completed the challenge in, I want to say, 2014, and I've done it about four times now, with the fourth run being the footage used for this video. I am far from being able to beat the toughest fights on one try, or getting through the challenge at a speedrunner level of quickness, and I'm positive that there are bound to be more efficient strategies for certain fights out there, but the ones I'm providing should give you a reliable way to get through each encounter. However, I would love to hear about any alternative strategies you might know of in the comments. I should also mention, with regards to stat boosting items, that's entirely your call as to whether or not you want to use any defense or power or AP ups that you may come across. As for the first two, their effects will be practically negligible, so it honestly doesn't really matter, the choice is yours. So with that, let's get ready to die a whole lot. Now before we really get started here, we need to deal with some pretty important stuff during the dive to the heart. When presented your choice of which weapon to pick and which to sacrifice, your best bet is to pick the staff. This gives you an extra unit of MP that you won't be afforded for picking sword or shield. As I mentioned, any boost to the damage you deal becomes inconsequential very early on in your run, and defense is also practically meaningless since most enemies will be able to kill you in about two hits. As for what you give up, it doesn't really matter all too much, I just went with the shield. Next up, and this is very important, when answering the Final Fantasy characters, you have to pick all of the bottom options so that your journey begins at night. On on a normal playthrough, this would make leveling up prior to level 50 take longer, and this is especially useful for us, because without that we could end up getting to level 2 before we're able to actually equip the 0 EXP ability. Speaking of which, your first opportunity to do that will be after fighting the shadows on the Aurora platform, so make sure to do so before moving on to Dark Side. As for Dark Side, there's literally no benefit to beating him, you know, it's not like there's any experience or items to be gained here, so if you want, you can rough him up a bit as you would normally. Me, I put all my energy into trying to die by getting punched in midair, which is frankly much more stylish than winning. Alright, so even though all of the Destiny Island duels are optional and only give you potions for winning, I thought I'd cover them because why not? And boy, would I come to regret that. Starting off with Waka, we'll learn some fundamentals of what you'll be doing throughout the run. Parrying is something that's going to come in handy a lot, like what we're doing here with Waka's Blitzball. Since we won't be learning any abilities from leveling up, we'll never have access to guard, which means the only way to deflect physical attacks will be with a timed Keyblade swing. I find Waka to be the easiest of the three to deal with, just hit his ball back at him and follow up with three hit combos, rinse and repeat. For Selfie, your best opportunity to get damage on her will be after parrying her jump rope when she's swinging it in a circle around herself. Best way to do that is with an aerial attack, like so. She'll always give you an audio cue for her doing this move by saying, You ready? You ready? You can parry her other attacks, but it's more difficult and they won't give you as good of an opening to retaliate. Don't bother trying to hit her while she's running around you like this. She'll take advantage of your missed swing and attack you back. Lastly, if you're nearby, if and when she falls to the ground, you can capitalize on that and get a free combo. Titus's attacks can be parried too, but I find it a lot easier to just wait for him to make a swing, step to the side, and retaliate with a combo. Anytime you're facing him head-on, you're in more danger, so you'll save yourself a lot of aggravation by just sidestepping and getting back at him with a combo. 
Okay, this sucks. I, I really don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this is one of the harder fights on level 1, and I personally had more trouble with it than even some of the super bosses. Thing is, those super bosses are always just one guy, but here you've got these three little middle school shitheads trying to make your life a living hell. You will likely hear Titus mock your loss many, many times. Okay, here's how I ended up tackling this. I take out Waka first, and we're going to be doing that pretty much exclusively by deflecting the ball and following up with combos. Thing is, you need to keep alert from Qs with Selfie and Titus so that they don't overwhelm you. The fight always starts with Waka behind you and to your left, about to use his basic throw attack, so I lock onto him and move toward the ocean a bit and deflect that. Before following up with a combo, you have to deal with whatever Titus and Selfie are trying to do. Basically, anytime Selfie preps her circle attack, I drop whatever I'm doing and deflect that before getting back to the task at hand. Also, it helps a lot to use L2 to switch between your lock-on targets. As for Titus, for every three attacks he doesn't land on you, he'll pause to lament how you're not fighting the way he'd prefer you to fight, and he won't attack for however long it takes to complain. Pay attention to how many times you hear him swing, and after three, that's your window to combo Waka, so long as you've also already neutralized Selfie. Notice how I try to keep all of them in front of me when I go for the combo, as to increase the odds that they'll get hit by one of my swings if they move in on me. Also, I highly encourage air combos here. In the one-on-ones, things are calm and slow enough to use ground combos, but using them here will leave you wide open much more often than not. If Waka goes for his big take this attack, I recommend just stepping to the side of it. You can parry it, but if you mess it up, it deals more damage than anything else that these three can dish out. I should also note that if Titus happens to get in the way of a blitz ball when you deflect it, it'll stun him for a really long time, so you can use that to get him off your back for a bit or get a free combo on him. For whatever reason, I don't think this can happen with Selfie, or at least I haven't seen it whenever she's gotten in the line of fire. Anyway, keep at this until walk is dealt with, and then you can turn to Titus without having to worry about ranged attacks. It's slow going, but I really only engage when it's safe, so I either try to synchronize Selfie being stunned and Titus complaining, or only engage with Titus if Selfie is relatively far away. So in the former scenario, you want to wait for Selfie's you ready attack, and then bait three sword swings out of Titus, and then go in for your combo. An important lesson here in general is to not get greedy. If you're going for a combo, but the situation becomes unsafe, just take one or two hits and then run away. Once you get down to just Selfie, it's business as usual, except your hands are probably a lot sweaty this time. Alright, after that nightmare, Riku is an absolute predictable and manageable joy to fight against. Riku always retaliates after every successful 4 hits you land on him, barring some weird exceptions like if you hit him while he's in the air. With that in mind, give him a ground combo and follow up with a single hit and then just sidestep out of his way when he tries to kick you in the teeth. Most important thing here is to keep track of how many hits you're on because if you lose track it's easy to get blindsided by a pair of shoes in your face. Basically everything Riku does offensively is easily avoided by just sidestepping him. Whenever he holds his sword up, it's quickest to just hit it 3 times, sidestep step and retaliate. Unlike in Sora's Dream, you do have to beat this incarnation of Darkseid, but it's not going to look too different from a normal playthrough. Air combos are going to be your friend here. Get as many as you can on Darkseid's hands in the beginning of the fight when he's shooting energy out of his big, disgusting chest hole. I like to get behind his wrist for a bit of coverage from the energy blast, and your Keyblade swings might just parry some of the ones that get close to you anyway. When he punches into the ground, I actually recommend climbing up and comboing his face. You won't be getting any tech points here, obviously, but it keeps you away from the shadows he summoned, which are a lot more dangerous than normal. Cool guys don't look at explosions or giant shadow monsters being cast into hell where they belong. In Traverse Town, there's no penalty for losing to Leon, but you do get an extra elixir later on for winning, which can and will be very useful in this run, so consider saving in the accessory shop beforehand and soft resetting if you lose, which is done on PS4 by pressing L1, R1, and Start all at once. Your two safest opportunities to hit Leon are after he lands from a jump and after stunning him by knocking his Gunblade Fireball back at him, and the latter is obviously even safer. Luckily, Leon will always start the fight by doing one of these two things, so you can react accordingly. If he jumps towards you, unleash an air combo on him and then retreat until he follows up with another jump or a fireball. Ideally, he'll start with the fireball, which you can deflect and then combo him while he's stunned. Afterwards, I like to bait some swings out of him like we did with Titus in hopes of getting him to launch another fireball, which he'll do at least half of the time whenever he does a little jump backwards. Through this, you can pretty much get him cornered up against the menu building and just play catch with him, except the ball is third degree burns. Also, this happened on one of my attempts. <laughs> And then he killed me. As for the soldier's pre-guard armor, we don't really have any tricks or tactics we can employ yet, so your best bet is really to just pick one of them, combo him away, and work on one at a time while Donald and Goofy engage with the others, and hopefully don't waste too many of the potions. When guard armor comes out, I always focus on the hands first, since they're pretty agile and somewhat harder to predict. The hands use a move that's kind of reminiscent of Selfie's circle attack, and you'll want to react to that in the same way with a parry in the air. Anytime the whole body launches into the air, you want to be in the air along with it right before it lands, as to avoid the shockwave when it hits the ground. Keep focusing on the hands 
and don't hesitate to use a potion or two if need be. As you work on the hands, keep an eye on the feet. If they do a flip in the air like this, they're about to come marching towards you, which you can parry in pretty much the same way as the hand spinning attack. Once all the limbs are gone, the body goes down without much of a fight, and it probably won't have enough time to get two hits on you once it's by itself. Now that guard armor is dealt with, I should mention, I do recommend going after all of the collectibles as you normally would, especially the 99 puppies, as the Aroga reward can be useful for some late game encounters. If you need any help with that, check out my treasure guide, he said shamelessly. Link in the description. Also, do everything you can with 100 Acre Wood, as having a stop upgrade and Sora's cheer ability will be even more crucial. Also, also, remember to check Donald and Goofy's inventory for any items that they may not have used, and promptly steal them for yourself. They're in better and more competent hands now. So the world order for a level 1 is a bit unorthodox, in fact we're only going to do two of these for now, and since battle level doesn't really matter, it makes the most sense to deal with deep jungle first if you ask me, as we'll at least get cure for beating the boss there. Since we have to pass one of the other worlds on the way though, you might as well stop at Olympus Colosseum to pick up thunder and whatever items are lying around. After getting thunder, there's no reason to do the prelims right now, the Inferno Band and Sonic Blade are going to be useless to us, so we actually won't be back here to do any fighting until we're halfway through Hollow Bastion. I mean you can do the prelims in the cups whenever you want, but I always save them for much later. In deep jungle, Sabor is a lot like Dark Side 1 in that there's really no incentive to waste any of your time or resources on this fight, so just die. Your next required encounters will be against five groups of Power Wilds, who will all go down with two thunders apiece, so that's what I recommend for an easier time here. If you want, you can do each fight and then heal up at a save point to get your MP back, and you can pretty handily deal with these battles. If your thunders don't finish everyone off, try to isolate enemies one at a time and then finish them off with combos. The final Sabor fight can be pretty tricky, as it's hard to land a full combo without taking damage, which you can do only twice before dying. Keep in mind, there will be scenarios where you're only one hit away from death even if your health isn't in the red, and this fight is an example of that in play. This fight might take a few tries, so I actually recommend turning around and exiting to the camp right when the battle starts. There's two benefits to this. One, you don't have to skip the cutscene every time you die, and two, it gives you much better positioning. Starting the battle from the cutscene has Sabor right in front of you, and he can get a really easy hit on you if you don't get out of the way quick enough. As for dealing damage, you have two options as I see it. As I said, full combos are tough to get off here, so you kind of have to nickel and dime Sabor with one or two hit aerial attacks here and there. A safer but maybe less controllable method is actually to use Goofy as a bodyguard. If you keep Goofy between you and Sabor and press triangle, there's a good chance Sabor's attack will be deflected by Goofy's shield, and that gives you a window to actually get a combo on him. After getting a full combo, I like to use all of my MP on launching fire spells at Sabor, which reminds me I should mention the damage storage bug slash feature, which isn't at all necessary here, but will be incredibly useful later on. Basically, there's this weird quirk about the no experience ability that enhances the power of your magic and summons, but only if your most recent attack was a full combo finisher. So moving forward, there'll be some occasions where we get a single combo off on a boss, and then swiftly end his life by using magic or summons, and I'll highlight those occasions later on, but it's something to keep in mind moving forward. It'll start to get more useful around Monstro. Anyway, I honestly think the Goofy strategy is your safest bet here, albeit a bit slower of a strategy. Keep that up until you can pull out Sabor's Tooth as a token of your victory like a goddamn barbarian. For Clayton, there's a lot of setup I put into this fight, and some of it might not be necessary, but it was one of the biggest roadblocks for me the first time I did level 1. First off, we want Goofy and Tarzan as party members. Tarzan actually already has a cure ability called Healing Herb, which makes him a better healer than Donald at the moment. To ensure that he won't waste his MP on anything else, unequip his offensive abilities and Wind Armor, aka Arrow, which is pretty much useless right now. If you want, you can use the leftover AP to equip his Critical Plus abilities, though I don't know how much of a difference they can make here. Second, and it might be overkill, but I load everyone up with potions and high potions, basically whatever I've got on hand. They're going to become pretty Pretty much obsolete once you get cure, so don't feel too bad about potentially wasting them. Okay, as for the fight, I recommend doing the same thing with Sabor in the beginning, ditch Clayton and come back so you don't have to skip the skipping. How privileged are we in 2019 that we can skip the skipping now? I had this cutscene's lines and choreography memorized back in 2002. Anyway, if you ask me, there's no harm in spamming thunder on the power wild since you don't really have much use for your MP otherwise, and the monkeys can quickly overwhelm you and the last thing you want is to start off the stealth sneak portion without full HP. As for Clayton himself, you generally want to stick to two hit combos as a third will send him flying away and give him time to recuperate, whereas you could pretty much bully him forever if you just go 1-2-1-2. One, two, one, two. Once I realized this, the fight got a lot more manageable. If the Power Wilds are taken care of, it really doesn't matter. You can just 3-hit combo him and you'll have enough time and space to follow up before he can retaliate. Okay, so Stealth Sneak kind of sucks. This phase always starts off with Clayton shooting his gun, so immediately roll out of the way. He follows this up with a charge attack, so your best bet is to get to an elevated position where he can't hurt you. After that, give them a full combo and they'll react with another charge. I got hit by it, but if you can, get back to higher ground before that can happen. But if not, it's really no big deal as someone will probably heal you before anything else can hurt you. Now you just want to spam air combo 
combos and keep an eye out for Stealth Sneak's swiping attack that he does with his feet, but I don't really ever get hit by that since I'm basically always in the air doing combos. Eventually, Clayton will be knocked off Stealth Sneak, and from here, I do like to get a full combo on him, both to knock him away from Sneak and to get some damage storage for Fire Spam, like with Sabor. After depleting your MP, your best bet is to do those two-hit combos to keep Clayton stun-locked in place. If Sneak is getting close, you can do a three-hitter to get Clayton into a space more conducive to a hassle-free beatdown. The fight gets pretty chaotic here, and while you can mitigate the chaos by keeping Clayton stuck in place, there's a bit of luck as to whether or not Stealth Sneak can easily hit you wherever you are, and that's where your party members can hopefully come in and heal you, and worst case scenario, you can dodge roll away to some cover and throw a potion for yourself. If your MP fills up again, you can let off some more fire spam, but otherwise just keep at those two hit combos until Clayton goes down. This is definitely the hardest required fight up to this point, so don't feel discouraged if it takes you a long time. It took me forever on my first attempt. Plus, you'll get Cure as your reward, which will make things a lot less stressful moving forward. Also, you might as well throw on Jungle King. At this early stage in the game, strength can still be somewhat useful, plus it's a bit longer than the Kingdom Key. Moving on to Wonderland, I do recommend getting as much evidence as you can, as having Donald and Goofy as participants in the battle, even if only as meat shields to take a few hits and die, is better than the alternative of everyone's focus being on you right from the jump. To play it safe, start the battle off by hitting the Queen of Hearts to get the red cards off your back. From there, just spam air combos on the tower and run back over to refresh the Queen's concussion if you hear her start yelling again. Even if you get hit by the black cards, you have Cure now, so this shouldn't be too much trouble. Also, I should point out that you'll almost always want to jump in the air before curing, as it comes out a lot quicker than if you do it grounded. This applies to all magic, but it can be a matter of living or dying when it comes to cure. Trickmaster honestly isn't too different than normal, but I really wouldn't even bother with getting on the table and jumping off to attack. After the first combo, I just jump from the ground and swing at the peak of my jump, and you should be able to get hits on him this way. After a few of these, he staggers, and you can get a couple of full combos on him. Of course, you can still use the table, it's entirely up to you. You can just do this to him even as he goes over to lay his batons at the stove, which is the most dangerous part of the fight, but even so, as long as you have cure and use it after every hit you take, you should be fine. This battle is a lot more dangerous if you choose to do it before deep jungle. If for whatever reason you did, just remember to take cover behind the chair or the stove if Trickmaster is firing off his projectiles, but yeah, just keep going for those high swipes and he'll go down pretty easy. I really don't have any strategic insight for opposite armor beyond what you do normally. He's just way less dangerous than guard armor even without cure, and he can't really hit you too many times quickly enough to pose a real threat. Just pick one limb at a time and have at it with air combos and heal if you do get hit. When he turns into a cannon, he's way more in danger than you are, and that's probably the easiest opportunity to get a bunch of combos on him. He should probably only take you one try. The first required fight in Agrabah will be against the bandits in the desert, and they can be pretty annoying and overwhelming if you try to do it normally. It's possible, but not really worth the frustration. Instead, if you just start the fight off by immediately summoning Simba, you can take out both waves by using two fully charged Proud Roars. I messed it up here and had to take out the second wave manually, but it's not the end of the world if this happens. It's Agrabah. Boo. Regardless, if you start your first charge quick enough, you'll have just enough MP left over to start up your second charge, which makes this fight incredibly quick and easy. Next up, you'll have to unlock a small keyhole in the bazaar to move the plot along, so there's a mandatory mob fight in here. This room can spawn Black Fungus, but it'll usually spawn regular Heartless, namely two Bandits and two Green Requiems on the starting ledge. If possible, avoid dropping down to the ground level, as that'll spawn a bunch more Heartless and make your life a lot harder. Just stick to air combos and try to hit the enemies towards the entrance to keep them on your level. Before moving on, don't forget to clean out Aladdin's inventory, as he's carrying some ethers, which can be used Useful. Besides taking a little longer to ether and then cure, there's no reason to use a potion instead of an ether since a potion is basically one cure but an ether can be three. Because of that, I generally like to have my inventory loaded with MP items, so I'm going into the pot centipede fight with three ethers in my pockets. Centipede is kind of a bad fight, probably the second toughest so far, especially if you're impatient. Whenever you get a combo on him when he's not transitioning between rooms, he breaks apart and you basically just have to sit and wait until he's done whipping around his little antenna things for another chance to move back in for more hits. Add in some pot spiders kamikaze bombing you from the heavens and this can get kind of of annoying. What you really want is for Centipede to move between rooms and do air combos, since when he's doing that, he doesn't break apart and go into his electric whippy tassily move, so you'll get a majority of your damage on him here. Try to stay up near the head as he's marching along, both to avoid the tail whip things and to keep from getting your attacks deflected. Also, you'll have arrow at this point, but I wouldn't recommend using it. Just cure after every hit and save your MP for that, and use your ethers if you need to. Beating Pot Centipede gets you the Ray of Light accessory, which is good because it raises your MP by one, but it also raises your HP a bit. Normally, this is also good, but in some parts of the run, having just a bit more HP can also make it so fully healing requires two cures, which can obviously be troublesome if you're in a tight spot, and this can potentially happen during Cave of Wonders. So you can wear it for Cave of Wonders or not, but regardless, you can throw it on afterwards and you should be fine. I wish I could tell you Cave of Wonders is merciful after a pretty annoying pot centipede fight, but it's actually a lot worse, and probably harder than Stealth Sneak if you ask me. By the way, you can avoid the scene skipping again if you back out into the desert at the start of the fight. So the issue here isn't so much the cave itself, it's the Heartless that spits out. Really, anytime you've got more than one enemy to deal with, even if it's a bunch of typically weaker enemies, you're generally going to be 
be in more danger. Particularly in this fight, the bandits can be a huge pain in the ass, as even if you're up on the cave's nose, they can fling themselves up there, knocking you off and probably killing you when you land. The cave always starts by shooting some energy from its eyes, usually right when they inevitably pierce Donald's soul, I summon Simba in anticipation for whatever the cave is going to spit out. If it's bandits, I use a proud roar to get rid of them so they can't bother me. If it's a fat bandit, you can just dismiss and hop onto the nose. It's kind of a gamble, but if you wait to see what gets spit out before summoning, you might not be able to get a full charge off without being interrupted. Once you're on the nose, I would just wait until he pulls up from the sand before trying to hit anything. After you raise the pie, you want to alternate between hitting each eye, and unfortunately you don't have scan, so you kind of just have to try and keep it even. When you take out the first eye, this causes air soldiers to spawn, which makes things 10 times worse, so we want to try and take the eyes out in close succession to avoid that. I tend to stick with using lock-on switching and doing two-hit combos. The third swing can kind of mess up your positioning and get you in the way of an incoming eye blast, so I try not to get greedy. From this point, you basically want to fight like hell to stay on top of the cave, and unfortunately there's a bit of randomness involved. If the cave spits out bandits again, they'll start throwing themselves up at you as well as messing up your lock-ons. Just try to stay calm, and if you find yourself on top of the cave with a bandit or two, I would just ignore them as a lot of the time they'll fling themselves off again. If they hit you, just cure and continue on with your eye hits. If and when the cave starts convulsing and shooting energy like crazy, it's best to either refrain from hitting, or if you're feeling brave, just go for single hits. Thankfully, this will be the last fight that's even somewhat difficult for like two worlds, so consider it a reward for having to put up with this garbage. After that, Jafar is really no hassle, pretty much the same as normal. I figured there's gotta be a quicker strategy, but I just wail on him with air combos like I normally would and wait to intercept him wherever he floats over to. Keep in mind, he always starts off with his laser, so dodge roll out of the way and take cover from that. Just try to stay out of the center of the room so you don't get caught in his big blizzard spell and you should be fine. Same with Genie Jafar, just assault Gilbert Gottfried until you win. Leave a little MP in reserve in case you need a cure, but if Iago is ever out of reach, you can do a little bit of damage by hitting Genie Jafar with blizzard spells in the meantime. You'll get three wishes for winning, but I usually don't bother equipping it. The strength boost is pretty much meaningless at this point, and Jungle King is longer, which can be useful in getting your combos to connect, so I just stick with that for now. For the first Parasite Cage fight, it's nothing too complicated or different from normal, and if you want, you can pull off a combo and then summon Genie for some damage towards magic attacks. Typically, Genie is good for single target encounters who are susceptible to magic based attacks, whereas Simba is better off being safe for crowd control situations. Genie won't be enough to take him down, but you can get some damage on him this way, and then follow up with more air combos until he's down. Make sure to equip Goofy's cheer ability afterwards, as that'll increase the amount of time your summons stay active, which is obviously really useful for this kind of run. The second Parasite Cage fight is pretty much more of the same, and I recommend doing the same thing as last time with a combo followed by Genie, and then more combos. In the event that you get hit by the Poison Breath attack, get somewhere safe and wait for the poison to run its course all the way before healing, otherwise you run the risk of healing as it's still damaging you, leaving you susceptible to getting takeout in one hit. Just go crazy with air combos and this shouldn't be too much trouble. It's only necessary to complete one of either Atlantica or Halloween Town to beat the game, and I'll cover both, but for now I suggest going to Halloween Town and saving Atlantica for later. Upon arriving, you should take off the Ray of Light if you still have it on, as enemies here like the White Knights and the Gargoyles are capable of hitting you for enough damage to require two cures if you're wearing it. The sacrifice of one MP kind of sucks, but it's preferable for some of the fights coming up. So there are three occasions where you're forced to fight some regular mob heartless here, the first of which is in the graveyard before getting the forget-me-not. There's not really a bad way to do this, but I like to take the shadows out manually since they're not too threatening and then summon Simba to one-shot the search ghost. The White Knights won't go down to a full charge roar, but it should weaken them to the point of being like one or two hits away from death. Or if you want, you can just stick with combos and magic spam. Either strategy should work fine. You'll have to pass through the graveyard again shortly after to get to the mayor near the tombstone minigame, so you can basically employ the same strategy again, and if you want, you have Dumbo now, so you can follow up with that if you want to play it safe. Once you get the Jack in the Box, I recommend continuing on to Moonlight Hill and lighting the lift, and then taking it back to the graveyard. The lift will stay there waiting for you, and you have to make your way to Oogie's Manor, which can cut out a third graveyard fight if you just show up, light it again and jump on. Once you take the lift, unless Black Fungi decide to spawn, you'll have a few regular Heartless spawn to your right, and you can use either Simba or Dumbo again here to take care of them. Regardless, you need to get rid of them in order to examine the small tombstone to make the hill extend. Try to keep the fight contained to the area where they spawn so you don't end up spawning more enemies. At the manor's front door, a couple of gargoyles and white knights will spawn. You can get the gargoyles to despawn if you get far away enough by hanging around near the cage to your left, but they're all manageable enough to just take out with combos and magic. After you get rid of them and open the door, you might want to back out to the bridge and come back so you don't have to fight them again and open the door if you die on lock, shock, and barrel. If you take any damage on your way up to the top of the manor, consider taking out the search ghost underneath this archway so you can open up your menu and use a cottage if need be. So for lock, shock, and barrel, it kind of sucks, and it's probably the first fight that might give you some difficulty since the Cave of Wonders. What's annoying is that they're all too short to reliably air combo, so you'll want to be sticking with ground combos, but this, of course, leaves you more open to attack. Lock is definitely the one you should save for last, as 9 out of 10 times you're getting hit in this fight, it'll be from the other two. Shock is probably the easiest to parry. You can hit her with an air attack while she's doing her spinning move, but you might be better off to just avoid her. You can really easily get stuck in a loop of getting hit, jumping up to cure, and then landing to get hit again, forcing you to jump up and cure once more. You can sort of avoid this when retreating to cure by jumping onto and above the couch since shock and barrel can't reach you there, and lock rarely ever hits me with his projectile when I'm on there. Keep in mind these three little bastards all drop a different thing when you smack them around. Money for barrel, HP for lock, and MP for shock. The first two aren't too useful in this scenario, but don't underestimate the amount of MP you can get
get back from the MP orbs that Shock drops, it can get you out of a jam if you're low on MP from Kirin. All in all, just try to pick one of the brats and focus on them before moving on to the other two. I tend to try and get Barrel first because I find him harder to deflect and easier to get hit by. Oogie Boogie Fight is sort of like Jafar and that it's not really difficult, just sort of tedious, although there's a bit more you can do to mitigate that. First off, I like to have Jack and Goofy with me for both of their cheer abilities, which Donald doesn't have yet. I also recommend having a Mega Potion in your items to heal your party so you can summon. It's better to burn the potion than to waste the time and MP on healing one or both of your party members. You'll have to take out the two gargoyles in the beginning and I would suggest saving your MP and just taking care of them with air combos. If you're able to take out the second one with the finisher, that's preferable as you'll have damage storage ready to use on Oogie, but if not, hit Oogie with the combo when raised up to his platform and I like to bait him into hitting and missing me with that first slap. Then summon Genie and just mash triangle on him. You might be able to take him out just by doing this, but I usually end up having to just do the fight normally after Genie runs out as some of his attacks usually get caught on something and don't connect with Oogie. Regardless, the fight isn't that hard and it's really just a warm up for the comparatively much tougher Oogie's manner fight. So this fight is hell if you try to do it normally, so we'll have to do it in a pretty abnormal way. You have to take out 7 shadow globs to win, and that's easy enough, except gargoyles will start spawning after you destroy the third glob. When you factor in multiple airborne heartless with the chaos of the landscape and the dark orbs and the fire being shot at you, it's a really difficult combination to deal with. You can almost completely circumvent the gargoyles though, and that's going to be key here. Start off by destroying two of the shadow globs that you have the toughest time reaching. I like to get the one closest to the big lantern and the one all the way at the top so I don't have to climb the whole manor if I get knocked off. When you're attacking these, try to keep track of how many combos it takes to destroy them. The goal is to know roughly how many hits it takes to take out a glob and get all of the globs to a few hits away from destruction. This way you can take out your first three safely and then just run to the rest of them, hit them a few times, and hopefully avoid getting overwhelmed by the gargoyles. When you're counting your hits, keep in mind that if your party members are also attacking, that's going to slightly screw up your count. If it took you, say, 12 combos to destroy an orb, but Goofy and Jack were hammering away at it alongside you, you might want to compensate for that when dealing with the next orbs. Since the Heartless starts spawning after the third one is taken out, you can pick another one that might give you the most trouble and take that one out safely before running around to pick off the remaining four. This one might take you a few tries, and it can be a lengthy process when compared to most other fights, the devil is really in the details here and it might take a bit of trial and error, so keep at it. After winning, but before you leave, now is a great time to revisit the bridge and the manor ruins to pick up any treasure you left behind, as Heartless won't spawn again until your return trip. This can save you a whole lot of trouble if you do this now instead of later. Also, you learn gravity after beating Oogie's Manor, which is the last of the first level magic spells, so I highly encourage going back to Traverse Town and getting Spellbinder from Merlin, which will give you a really useful boost to your MP, which is the only stat that really matters right now. I should note that by this point, you can finish 100 Acre Wood and get everything you want from it, so long as you make a quick stop at Atlantica and take the Torn Page out of Ariel's Grotto. As long as you've been picking them up as well as collecting enough puppies for the Torn Page reward from the Dalmatians, you can have access to both the Stopra upgrade and Sora's cheer ability if you get high scores on all of the minigames and then talk to Owl. Alright, your next required fight is going to be Anti-Sora and Neverland. Before starting, you shouldn't be in danger of needing two cures to heal right now, so you can pop the Ray of Light back on for that extra MP. Also, after you do the Green Trinity for the ladder, it doesn't hurt to just leave and re-enter the cabin. This way, if you happen to die, you don't have to redo the Trinity over and over. Hopefully this won't matter though, as Anti-Sora isn't too difficult. For the record, I recommend just going for ground combos here as he's a bit too short to reliably air combo. I like to start off with a ground combo and then bring Dumbo in. I'm not sure how much damage it does, but it really can't hurt, plus you're invulnerable from damage, which is a lot safer than using Genie in these close quarters. Keep in mind that using Splash makes Dumbo's MP drop faster, so if Antisora melts into the ground, hold off and wait for him to resurface before spraying him again. After Dumbo runs out, this is basically just a glorified Titus fight. Keep an eye on Anti-Sora, bait out his swings, and then close in with a combo. If you're feeling safe, you can follow up a successful combo with a bit of fire spam, but I would suggest leaving some emergency MP for cure. Anytime Anti-Sora is seemingly disappeared, stay on the move or he'll catch you with an upswing attack when he rises out of the floor. Also, when you get to the point when comboing Anti-Sora turns him into a dark cloud for a few seconds, you want to dodge roll away immediately before he reforms and hits you. This fight can also take a few minutes, but if you stick to the plan, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Before heading out to the deck, I suggest having your item slots filled with a Mega Potion and two Ethers if possible. Before Captain Hook, there's a mandatory fight against three waves of Heartless. When the battle begins, run back into the ship interior and come back out to avoid the cutscene. You got a few options for dealing with the Heartless. If you want, you can probably handle them well enough in the old-fashioned way, or you can get damage storage ready and then go for Dumbo or Simba, or both if you want. Simba's pretty good as you can go up high where the pirates can't reach you and use them to take them all out in one full charge. Another full charge won't take out the air pirates that spawn afterward, but it should stun them and leave them only a hit or two away from death. After that, some battleships will spawn, which you can take out in whatever way you want. It's usually managed enough to just air combo them. Once the hook fight starts, immediately back out and leave Donald to his death. Not only does this let you skip the pre-fight cutscene, but you won't have to deal with the Heartless fight again if you die. Captain Hook is another fight that could get you a few times, and it's likely to take a few minutes. Alongside Captain Hook are some Battleship Heartless, which aren't exactly worth killing since Hook will just respawn them anyway, but they are good as a safer option to hit with physical attacks to regain your MP. I also like to use them to get damage storage set up, since they're bigger and easier to land a combo on than Hook. In whatever order you want, bring out Dumbo and Genie and focus your attacks on Hook. It won't be enough to take him out though, and you'll need to fight him on normal terms to finish him off. One of your safer openings to attack is when Hook is using his dash attack, or by dodge rolling 
in as he's winding down from throwing one of his explosive presents. Another thing you should keep in mind is that whenever you knock him off the boat, he always returns to the deck in the same way, by floating up and hanging out in midair for a few seconds on the same side of the mast. If you're prepared, you can meet him there and get off a free 2 or even 3 hits if you get lucky. Lastly, if you ever need to heal, your best bet is to fly up and do it over the ocean out of harm's way. Also, I killed Hook in midair, which I thought was pretty cool. Your next big fight is unfortunately Riku, and this honestly just sucks ass. Back in Destiny Islands, you could get a whole combo off on Riku, but that is no longer the case. Riku hits you back on every third hit, so a full combo will almost definitely end with you taking damage. However, we still want to take advantage of damage storage to make this a bit less painful, so try to get a three hit combo off, make sure Donald and Goofy are alive, and summon Dumbo to get some free damage on him. Or at least, I think. I'm honestly not sure if it does damage. Um, I do know that unfortunately Genie isn't really useful here due to his magic based attacks, which Riku just shrugs off. After Dumbo runs out, you can summon Tinkerbell basically as life insurance. Still cure yourself whenever necessary, but if you run out of MP and ethers, you can essentially wait Riku out and have Tinkerbell heal you back to full health. And if things get really desperate, you can run alongside the walls on both the lower and upper levels and break the pots for HP balls. If you don't mind getting hit and having to heal over and over, you can just try to go for the 3 hit combo, but otherwise, the best way to whittle his health down is to just nickel and dime him with single and double hits, usually when he's in the air or landing from a jump. It sucks and it might take a few tries, it's definitely up there for one of the more frustrating main story battles. Beating Riku gives the ability to use White Trinity, so you can go and get all of those now. You should especially look into going back to Wonderland and getting Lady Luck. It doesn't change your MP from Spellbinder, but it has a higher strength. It won't be too useful for Hollow Bastion, but when we go back and deal with stuff from other worlds, it'll come in handy against the weaker Heartless. There are a couple of required fights on your climb up the castle, the first of which will be in the upper part of the castle gates, where you'll need to clear out the Heartless in order to activate the Lift Crystal. I like to turn right and glide over to the orange platform and wait for the Wyverns to follow me. It's easier to get them trapped against the two walls here and air combo them to death, and it reduces the risk of you falling back down to base level. You have to fight some wizards on the big elevator here, and none of the summons are really good for it, so just do air combos on them. It actually might be better to use two hit combos to keep the wizards from teleporting after every finisher, but I only thought of it after the fact, so it could be worth a shot. So I went back to film this on a different save file because it totally slipped my mind, but you don't need to mess with any of the blocks here even if you want to get the royal crown accessory. When you arrive at the high tower area here, you can just glide down into the hole in the wall beneath the blocks. I highly encourage doing this since the royal crown gives you an extra 2 MP at the cost of some strength, which as you know doesn't matter all that much in this run. Now if you just want to progress and avoid having to fight any mob heartless, you can use the Dumbo trick on this ledge here, just ascend as high as possible and dismiss and you could bypass the puzzle. Try to wait for the wyverns to attack you first, otherwise they might snipe you out of the air when you're making the transition to the ledge. So in preparation for Maleficent, you might as well use a cottage to heal everyone up, and you're also going to want gravity on your shortcut menu so you can bring her floating rock to the ground. For some easy damage, you can just do a combo on her and then bring Genie out and then spam Showtime. After that, I use Dumbo, and if I'm being honest, again, I don't really know if he takes damage from it, I can't really tell. If you have the MP for it, you can also bring out Tinkerbell again as some life insurance. Regardless, just use gravity on her platform whenever you can and hit her with air combos, and I would just get out of the way and hug the sides of the walls if she starts to use the meteor attack. As for the Heartless she spawns, if they're giving you trouble, you can take out at least one of them for a bit more breathing room, but you'll want to leave the other alive as killing both will just make her respawn two replacements. Overall, not very hard, and you'll get Donald's cheer ability for winning, which is going to be useful moving forward. However, I am an idiot who forgot to equip it before fighting the dragon, which unnecessarily makes the fight harder, but it's still doable even without it. Starting off, it's going to be hard to get a solid air combo on the dragon if you just go for it right off the bat, so I like to circle around her a little bit and make her turn to face me. As she's turning, that's a good time to go in for your combo. Once you land your finisher, fly away from the center and land to heal the likely dead Donald and Goofy, and then bring out Genie. Just go nuts with the showtimes and try to avoid getting hit by her stomp shockwaves by using it in the air. You might be able to finish her with Genie if you have all of your cheers equipped like you should, but if not, you can bring out Dumbo next and finish her off that way. Remember to stop using Splash when she's out of range so you don't waste Dumbo's MP. All in all, it's actually not too bad, but it might take a while to get the hang of the beginning since it's pretty hectic. I'd say the fight is pretty much won or lost within the first 10 to 15 seconds. Alright, so here's the deal. The game changes a lot if you move ahead with the story right now. That is, everything you haven't done yet will become a lot harder after your fight with Riku Ansem. There's nothing stopping you from moving the story forward, but I highly encourage you to do all of the optional content that we've skipped so far because you'll want everything you can get at your disposal for some of the upcoming fights. The big three things here are Atlantica, everything in Olympus Coliseum, and Synthesis. I'll be covering the first two as our next destinations, but the Synthesis is totally up to you. It's entirely possible to synthesize everything on level 1, including the Ultima Weapon, but it's going to be a gigantic pain in the ass with how beefy these Heartless are and without any lucky strike abilities. If you wanted to tackle Synthesis, now would be the time to do so while the enemies are still relatively weaker. Keep in mind, you'll need to advance the plot past Riku Ansem in order to get some of the necessary materials 
real, so you can only do so much while conditions are more tolerable. With that being said, we're going to go to Atlantica next. You really don't have to do it, but getting your Thunder upgraded by beating Giant Ursula can make some of the Olympus Cups much more bearable, so I like to deal with this first. Right when you're dropped off in Atlantica, you'll need to take out some Heartless after learning how to swim. Your go-to move in this world is going to be Fire Spam. It melts the Sea Neons like butter, and it's not too bad at dealing with some of the other Heartless you might come across in Atlantica. You might as well swap Goofy out for Ariel, as she's capable of acting as another healer, and if you want, you can do what we did with Tarzan and unequip her non-healing MP ability so that curing is her sole function. Your next fight will be with the Shark, but don't bother with him on your first visit. You only need to fight him when you return on your way to Ursula's Lair. And you guessed it, the strategy here is going to be getting a combo and then launching fireballs at him like your life depends on it, because it kind of does. If you need to heal, try to move away and vertically in either direction before doing so. Overall though, a pretty simple fight. This Ursula fight really isn't all too different from the normal one, the big difference is that you'll probably need to be a bit more conscious of your MP and your positioning. I recommend going into the battle with your item slots filled with ethers and start off by spamming fire into the cauldron. You know, I grew up thinking you had to use different spells depending on the color, but it's got nothing to do with you, it's actually just showing you what attack Ursula is going to use. While you're shooting fires though, try to move around a bit, as staying in place makes it really easy for Flotsam and Jetsam to swim up and smack you in the face. Speaking of, if you need to cure, it's the same way as it was for the shark, position yourself above or below them and a bit far away from where you got hit before healing. If you try to do it immediately after getting hit, you're likely just going to get hit again. But yeah, be mindful with your fire spam, move around, and try not to shoot any unnecessary fires when Ursula is already vulnerable and hit her with some combos. If you run out of ethers, Flotsam and Jetsam are there to replenish your MP by hitting them, and this can be an annoying fight and can take a while, but overall it's not too bad. Now, Giant Ursula can be a problem if you try to do it relatively normally, which I initially did. Well, kind of. Originally, I just went for damage storage fire spam, but I just kept getting killed in one way or another. The strategy here still involves damage storage fire spam, but I also use Stopra in between to keep her locked in place. So if you haven't done 100 acre wood yet, for Stopra, it would be a good time to do it. I'm sure this is still somewhat doable with regular Stop, but you might as well up your odds. Because this fight's going to be a huge drain on your MP, you should really go into it with three elixirs, and even those might not be enough. If it's proving to be an issue, you can make your party Goofy and Ariel turn off all of their MP abilities and give them some ethers or elixirs, that way they'll only use them on you when you need them. The biggest issue with trying to do this without Stop is the constant stream of lightning strikes that form over Sora while Ursula is also throwing out attacks. Using Stop not only makes Ursula freeze for a few seconds, obviously, but it also stops the lightning, allowing you to get a short, uninterrupted burst of fire spam. In. The way I do it, I open with a combo for damage storage, then stop, and then use as much fire as I can, and then after stop wears off, I still try to get some fires in while Ursula is active. You could go for another stop, but at that point your MP is probably low enough that you won't be able to take full advantage of your stop window to attack. So use the rest of your MP, pop an elixir, rinse and repeat. On this run I ended up running out of MP and I had to swim in and out for combos, but like I said, if MP becomes an issue, consider the strat with Goofy and Ariel to have a steady supply of magic. Winning this fight gets you Thundara, as I mentioned, which can come in handy for our next stop, Olympus Colosseum. Remember the prelims? It's time to do those. Even on level 1, you're pretty overpowered for these, especially with magic at your disposal. I'd walk you through these, but the answer is literally always going to be using Thunder, and then picking off any stragglers who survived. Cloud is pointless to waste any time on, you won't get anything for winning or miss out on anything for losing, so just get Buster sorted in your face. Cerberus is kind of surreal. On normal playthroughs, he's actually kind of intimidating, but now, even on level 1, he's a pushover. Get your combo, climb up the stands a bit, summon Genie and Showtime him to death. Look at that, Genie bodying Cerberus, that's Disney magic right there. Also, I swear I didn't cut this, I like warped or something right here, look at that, what is happening here? Alright, from this point on, the first three cups will be open to you after leaving. I recommend doing at least the basic version of each one, as you'll get a gravity upgrade, strike rate, and the yellow trinity ability for doing so. If you want, you can do the solo and time trial versions, especially if you want to go for synthesis, but you'll definitely have to do the time trials before going back to Hollow Bastion. I also wouldn't bother doing the fill cup time trial, as the reward is a tech boost ability, which is literally useless for us in this run. If you remember the prelims, I'm just going to give you a couple of guesses as to how you should probably deal with most of the mob fights, so I'm just going to skim through and give you tips on anything out of the ordinary. The final fill cup battle is fittingly the most difficult, even though there are yellow operas in play, start off with a thunder to get rid of the blue rhapsodies and then pick off the yellow operas either with blizzard or with air combos. You'll want them out of the picture before moving on to the armor body. For the Black Fungus halfway through the Pegasus Cup, remember my advice for dealing with poison during Parasite Cage. If you get hit with any of the fungus attacks, wait until the poison stops draining you before healing. Also, if they're in their invincible state, run away and hit Triangle if you don't want Donald and Goofy to waste their HP and MP on trying to fight them, and they'll run over to your position. With Leon and Yuffie, I pretty much just play it straight. I start on Yuffie and deflect her shurikens and basically just wail on her. Keep your ears open for Leon and stay mobile so he can't easily hone in on you. Once you get Leon on his own, he's really not much of a threat, just watch out for his attack where he yells, it's over, it goes for a big jump attack. You're probably more likely to get hit by the upswing than the actual landing, so be wary of that. 
The Heartless and the Hercules Cup are going to be a bit more resilient to your Thunder spells, especially the Pirates for whatever reason, so I tend to just fire spam on them when they show up in large groups. Still, Thunder is the way to go for a lot of these encounters, and don't hesitate to use some Ethers during any of the Cups. When you get to the Rare Truffle, it's kind of pointless, but if you want, you can regain MP by juggling the Rare Truffle, but it's probably not worth your time. Still, it could be good practice, and being decent at bouncing the Truffles could be useful for farming Elixirs and Mega Elixirs later on. Cloud is kind of annoying, and I find him to be annoying even on regular playthroughs. I just never really feel like there's a great opening to get hits on him, but I guess your best bet is to try and parry his sword swings and attempt to get a combo off. I went into the fight just planning to do that, but figured fire spam might be good and it seemed to help a lot. His Omni Slash attack, when he powers up and flies around, can be tricky to avoid, but if there are other party members active, Cloud might target them, so honestly, my advice is to make sure at least one of your party members is healed, so Cloud might target them instead of you on a couple of his slashes. I guess it kind of goes against the whole my friends or my power thing, but we gotta work with what we have here. Hercules is pretty much unchanged from a normal run, I literally just do the whole song and dance with the barrels and follow up with combos, parrying his headbutt attack when it comes, or let him combo you like a scrub, the choice is yours. Despite being the latest of these three tournaments, I think Herc is probably the easiest of the final round so far. Now that you can do Yellow Trinities, you should definitely swing by Neverland and pick up the upgrade to Arrow. I know we haven't really used it at all, but it comes in pretty clutch for some end of the world stuff later on. Alright, if you're satisfied with everything now, now is the time to move on to Riku Ansem back at Hollow Bastion. Remember, this will be your last chance to visit any of the worlds while all the Heartless are still relatively manageable. Also, you've got Fire Glow from beating the dragon, so you can go and get Mushu now, but he won't be too useful until end of the world. Without further ado, this jerk. At least unlike Riku 1, this fight doesn't prevent you from getting off safe combos, but you also won't be able to use Tinkerbell for insurance. Luckily, we can pretty much trap Riku and get the majority of our damage on him this way. It might take a few tries to get the timing down, but you can pretty much lock Riku into being practically helpless by hitting him with single strikes at a certain rhythm. One, two, three, four. You want just a little bit of a delay between your third and fourth hits. On four, if Riku retaliates with his spin slash, you can go right back into the one, two, three, four and keep him stuck there for a good while. If he breaks out of it with his dash, that's all right, just jump away and cure. For a safe opportunity to get him back into it, wait for his move where he sidesteps and does a slash into the ground. When Riku's hand starts glowing and he says, now witness true power, you can just get a full combo off on him and another one or two hits if you're feeling brave. At this point, you can continue trying to loop him after he goes for his ground slash or wait him out until he stopped glowing. Honestly, I recommend the former because as the fight goes on, you'll have to become comfortable with dealing with Riku while he's in this state anyway. If you're lucky, you can get Riku stuck in the loop before he can ever do his dark aura move, but odds are you'll have to deal with it. Honestly, it's not so much dangerous as it is annoying to have to sit through. If it comes up, just hug the invisible wall closest to the way you entered the room and glide in place. The fight is actually a lot more manageable than Riku 1 in my opinion, but it requires you to know a bit more strategy to do it without too much trouble. Alright, the next mandatory fighting you'll have to do is on your climb back up the castle. At the castle gates is basically a harder version of the fight you had the first time, but I suggest the same initial strategy of gliding over to this orange platform. This will despawn half of the wyverns and all of the air soldiers, and you can choose to deal with the remaining wyverns and red nocturnes however you want. You can throw out some gravities mixed in with air combos, or you could summon Dumbo for some free invincible damage. Keep in mind you need to stay above the platform even when riding Dumbo, otherwise you'll helplessly float down to base level and question why you even made a YouTube account. On your second elevator ride, Dumbo actually comes in handy yet again, and he can reliably take out the yellow nocturnes and put a dent into the air soldiers. Don't bother spraying the wizard as they won't take any damage, and then just finish off the stragglers with air combos. And once again, skip over any high tower nonsense by using Dumbo to skip up to the ledge leading into the castle chapel. Yeah, Dumbo has a pretty good run here on the return trip. Keep in mind, you can now get access to Aroga as the last puppy chest is in the Grand Hall, so you can grab that and head back to Traverse Town and collect your last set of gifts. The Behemoth is no real threat, mostly just a nuisance that takes a while to beat. I typically do a combo to set up damage storage for Genie, but Showtime can hit at an awkward angle sometimes, so your degree of success might be limited here. I might have just had bad positioning, so you might have better luck. If Genie doesn't finish him off, your best move is to spam gravity spells on the horn and just combo him whenever he's vulnerable. Speaking of gravity spam, that's going to be your guiding strategy for pretty much everything in the end of the world, starting off with the mandatory fights you'll have in the final dimension area. You're going to want to jump, gravity, and then repeat while switching your lock on to different targets using L2. You should have plenty of MP to employ this strategy comfortably for everything in this area, plus you should have a bunch of cottages saved up, so you might as well use them, just make sure you've got at least one left for linked worlds. Also, some of the chests in this area will spawn Heartless, but a lot of these items really aren't worth fighting for, like the Pretty Stone, so you can, once again, check my Treasure Guide's End of the World section to know which chests you might want to open. And of course, with the Behemoth, you can just use the same exact strategy I talked about for the one in Hollow Bastion. As for World Terminus, if you've been following this guide, you shouldn't have to do any of these fights until the Hollow Bastion section. I really don't even recommend doing them for the items, as almost all of them are just gem synthesis items. The Invisibles in the hallway here can get out of hand if you give them enough time, so wait for them to spawn in and then start hitting them with the gravities, and they should go down without much of a 
the fight. Same for the two in the room with the machine. Okay, Chernabog is really fun because you pretty much just completely bypass this fight. If you're anything like me, well, first of all, bless your soul, but this fight gave you a lot of trouble as a kid, and now you can almost effortlessly dispatch him without much thought. So just fly up to his face, get a combo, make sure Donald and Goofy are still alive, and land on the mountain. Summon Mushu, fly back up to face level, hold triangle, and Mushu will just mercilessly spitball him to death. Fighting fire with fire in the most ridiculous and satisfying way. And that's it. Now this is kind of unorthodox, and obviously you wouldn't be doing this if you were speedrunning, but with Super Glide in hand, and having gone as far as you can go into End of the World without reaching Linked Worlds, it's as good a time as any to go back to Olympus and take care of the Hades Cup. In specific, I think it could be a decent investment to get the Hades at least, and beat him for the Graviga upgrade, as well as any other magic upgrades you'll get along the way. This video is already long enough, so I'm going to try and cover only the noteworthy encounters here. I should note that Thundara and Gravir aren't going to be as effective until they get upgraded, Thundara especially. I would probably go into the first 10 rounds of the cup with your hotkeys being Kiraga, Firaga, and either Gravira or Blazara. Also, Aroga can actually start being decently useful here, so if you're having trouble getting bombarded by enemies, consider using an Aroga at the start of the more problematic fights if you don't mind using the MP. So with Yuffie, it's obviously the same as the fight with her and Leon, but more manageable. I recommend just going for the parry on the ninja stars instead of trying to dodge them and stay on her so she can't get a heal in. The behemoth is the same as all the others, except this is a sanctioned match, so summons aren't allowed. So I would just go with the Gravira spam and combos. Beating the behemoth upgrades you to Blazaga, and you should keep in mind that you can drop out after every 10 battles, and you can pick up where you left off without penalty, and I'd actually encourage doing that so you can get your refill on MP and HP, switch up your customization, and restock on any items you might have used. I'd also recommend using Blazaga on the torches now that you have it, so you can claim the Shiva belt reward, which will give you an extra unit of MP. Like the Behemoth, Cerberus is made a bit more cumbersome by not being able to summon. I honestly just fight him like normal and throw some magic in here and there. Patience is going to be key here unless you don't mind jumping away and curing over and over. Remember to heal even if your health isn't in the red. You can parry the biting attack, but I always find the timing kind of awkward, so I usually go in for two or three hit combos. And then I dodge roll away and then wait for him to bite before moving back in. You'll get Thundaga for beating Cerberus here, and it might pay dividends to back out and put that somewhere on your shortcut menu. For Cloud and Leon, I like to focus on Leon first since Cloud is a bit... Uh, louder with how he telegraphs his moves, so I find him easier to avoid. Since you can drop out after this match, consider going all out with a fire spam, leaving enough for Kier for emergencies. I like to approach Leon by jumping toward him, sometimes gliding a bit above him and baiting out his attacks. The only downside is he might decide to clip you with his upswing attack, so keep that in mind. After Leon's dealt with, the cloud strategy from before remains the same. Remember to have one or both of your parties healed and active when he starts up his Omni Slash attack. Hades is kind of weird, and to be honest, I don't really have a great handle on what the best way to deal with him is. Blizzard moves do double damage against him, and that can be boosted with damage storage, but it seems to very quickly send him into his big spinny firewall attack, which isn't really that dangerous, but it's a huge time suck as you can't damage Hades during this time, so use that at your discretion. If you're having trouble approaching Hades while he's moving around freely, consider waiting at a distance and parrying his big fireball so you can stun him and move in for some more damage. The real prize of the Hades Cup is one right here as you get the Graviga upgrade, so you can actually just quit now, but you can continue on to Rock Titan if you want. These last 9 fights before Rock Titan are obviously some of the hardest, and I would recommend going all out with a gravity spam, especially on fights with Invisibles and Angel Stars in the mix. The penultimate fight is especially dangerous as it's fought in 5 waves, and the last one is especially chaotic, so try to conserve enough MP to deal with that and be liberal with either Aether or Elixir usage. During the fights with the Stealth Sneaks, that's a great time to just go for physical attacks and build up your MP if necessary. To a lesser extent, you can get 15 free hits on the White Mushrooms if you attack them separately to regain some of your MP as well. Rock Titan is just about as much of a joke as he is normally, you can pretty much do whatever you want. I didn't think to do it, but if you throw up a Roga, you'll always be getting damage on him by just being near him, and that'll be for basically the entire fight, so probably do that. If you really wanted to, you can do the Hades Cup solo, but your only reward is going to be Save the Queen for Donald. The Time Trial is, I think, pretty much impossible on level 1, and I think that's the only thing you really can't do during the challenge, but you're really only missing out on Save the King. This is also sort of an unorthodox next step, but I think you should consider going after the Phantom in Neverland before moving on to the rest of End of the World. He's by far the easiest of the super bosses, as well as almost everything left in End of the World, and you're just as well equipped to fight him now as you'll ever be now that you have all of your magic spells at level 3. Plus, the reward is Stopka, and that can be particularly useful for Linked Worlds. The only setup you really need is in the Elixir department, as I recommend having 7 on hand for the fight just to be safe. Elixirs are hard to come by after you open all the chests and get all the trinities, but you have a couple of options. Don't even bother synthesizing them, it's a huge waste of time and not at all a fair trade-off. The less reliable option, but potentially the more bountiful one, is to go after rare truffles on the ship deck in Neverland. They're the easiest to juggle here thanks to being able to fly, and they can drop both elixirs and mega elixirs. Only problem is it can be annoying to get them to spawn in the first place. The more reliable route is to go to Rabbit's house in the Hundred Acre Wood and pull out all of his vegetables, enter his house, and then repeat. I actually didn't know this was a repeatable thing, but you can farm elixirs this way along with potions, which you can probably just sell at this point. You can only get one elixir per batch, so if you get one, just head back inside 
ride and repeat. It can take a while to get a stash built up, but it's definitely more reliable. So Phantom really isn't difficult at all, you just need to go in with the right strategy. The reason I suggest getting so many elixirs is because I tried to do this with three in Sora's inventory and I just didn't have enough MP to do it and maybe I just got unlucky with how many times he used one of the colored orbs instead of the white ones and I wasted so much MP by curing too often. So here's what I do, you need Peter Pan in your party to even access the fight so he is a lock. I'm putting Goofy instead of Donald because we actually don't want Donald doing any curing and Goofy can hold more items. Believe it or not, we're gonna give four elixirs to Goofy and I know it's a frightening prospect. Magic customization is up to you, but I like to keep Cure on deck, and I usually just manually use Stop and Thunder when needed since Fire and Blizzard require more aiming, so I like to have them shortcut it as well. We're going to make sure everyone's MP using abilities are turned off, and we're also going to customize Goofy and Peter Pan to make their physical attacks as infrequent as possible so they don't steal your hits when the Phantom uses the White Orb. Basically, Goofy is just holding our drugs for us, you're going to be the only one using MP, and we want him to use them only on you. The catch here is that Goofy will use it on anyone whose HP is low as well, so here's the deal. We're going to kill Peter Pan. For the first few seconds of the fight, we want to keep him alive and hopefully not let him get hit by the Phantom, but we want the clock to run out on him so he's out of the fight and Goofy can't heal him. You won't have to worry about Goofy healing himself because the Phantom will just one-shot him. So after Peter dies is when I recommend you start using Stop on the Clock Face because we want Goofy alive at least long enough for him to use the four elixirs on us. And that's pretty much the gist of it. It's going to be a long fight and you should have more than enough MP to get it done and you honestly might be able to do it without giving Goofy any elixirs, but it's a solid backup plan if you ask me. As for battle tips, Phantom will always retaliate after you hit his orb three times with a basic swipe attack which you can just move away from. After you get three hits on his orb again he'll move to the clock and shoot his tracking energy thing at you which you can avoid by just hiding close to the corner on another side of the clock face. Apart from that you just keep an eye out for the clock hands and make sure they're stopped and you should eventually chip Phantom's HP down over time. For me it took about 10 minutes. Alright back to end of the world and I won't lie this sucks. Also I have 2012 money and it's the end of the world. Coincidence? Yes. Okay, a bit of setup for Linked Worlds. I recommend the shortcut menu of Stop, Gravity, and Cure. One of your item slots should definitely be a Mega Potion to make sure your party is active for when you need to summon. The other two can be Elixirs or Mega Elixirs, it's up to you. I went for the Mega Elixirs because we've got a lot to spare. Once you enter the room, a Behemoth will leap towards you and almost certainly kill Donald and Goofy, which is fine. Just make sure to get out of the way before you get trampled yourself. Once again, Behemoth can be taken down with Genie or Gravity Spam or a combination of both. Genie is fine to use here as you'll still be able to use him again for later waves, but it's likely that you'll die a few times attempting this and I get impatient having to watch the summoning cutscene, so I just do gravity and combos. Ideally, you'll want to kill the behemoth with a finisher so you have damage storage active. The next part is really important, and I wish I knew about it the first time I did Linked Worlds. As soon as the behemoth dies, super glide over to the emblem door and start pressing pause. The command menu is going to turn blue for a very short amount of time, and you want to pause when this happens as this will let you access the menu. When you do, use a cottage and get everyone all healed up. The next fight is doable if you mess this up, but it's going to be made a lot harder. The first wave of Heartless that spawns after the short cutscene are a bunch of dark balls, and the best way to deal with them is to do damage storage Dumbo. Even if you have some extra Dumbo MP left over after you get rid of them all, just dismiss because you want to be prepared and ready for the next part. The next wave is a bunch of invisibles and this is one of two make or break points in this fight. You want to be kind of in the middle of the room as they spawn in and you need to let them spawn in all the way before casting stop. You really want to get all six of them frozen in place so it might take two stops. Once they're all stuck, use gravity like crazy, switching your lock on between them after each casting. You'll likely need to refill your MP at this point and thanks to having stop go, you'll have the extra time to stop down and use one of your elixirs or mega elixirs and still have enough time to keep using gravity on the invisibles. It's okay if one invisible doesn't get stopped, as one is pretty manageable to deal with using just air combos. The transition to the next wave is tricky because you need Donald and Goofy alive, you need enough MP to summon Simba, and you need to do it quickly enough, like preferably right after the last invisible dies and before or right as the angel stars start spawning in. When the transition to the third wave is happening, summon Simba, and if you can, try to be away from the center of the room and near a wall. As soon as he's summoned, start charging up and release as soon as possible. This should take out everything in the room. Don't wait for anything else to start spawning in, immediately start charging up again. If everyone in your party has cheer, you'll be able to do this for the rest of the waves. If you mess up and Simba is gone before the last wave is cleared, you'll just have to go all out with whatever's left at your disposal. Gravity and stop, spam, even Genie, or you can bring in Tinkerbell for insurance. This is by far one of the hardest and most strategically demanding fights in the game, even more so than some of the optional bosses, so it might take you a good few tries. Also, I just want to say, this is one of my failed attempts, and Donald came in clutch here. Three times in a row, I don't want to see a single shitty meme about how he's a bad healer, he's the boy, he always has been, he always will be, hashtag Zeta Flare.
Final rest is the point of no return, so let's stop down for a bit of preparation. Now's the time to fill everyone's slots with Mega Elixirs and Elixirs. You do have the opportunity to do this after Ansem 1, but if you die on Dark Side or Ansem 2, you'll have to do it all over again, and this can get annoying, so I just do it here. Donald or Goofy might waste one of them during Ansem 1 if you're unlucky, but I'd rather that than have to scroll through the menu every time I die to Ansem 2, which can be a tricky fight. Also, this won't be useful for the first two Ansem fights, but you want fire and gravity on your shortcut menu, that's super important. Finally, Strike Raid can come in handy for Ansem 2, you definitely don't need it, and it's more of a failsafe option, so the choice is yours. You'll need to use some AP ups to have enough AP for both dodge roll and strike raid, so it's up to you if you want to do that. The alternative is making sure you just don't get hit by Anthem's submit move, and if you do, you'll likely need to use a lot of MP on curing. With that, let's head through the door. So after Linked Worlds, the game cuts you a break and makes Ansem 1 a complete joke. Get a combo on him, make sure Donald and Goofy are alive, summon Mushu, and hold Triangle to win. Simple as that. If you want, you can use a Cottage after Ansem before heading into the arena to get a full heal. Dark Side is pretty much the same as before, except now you've got a lot more at your disposal. I like to combo his head when he's at ground level about 3 or 4 times, then back up a bit, and then go crazy with Fire Spam when his hands are holding the big energy ball. Even after his hands are out of Keyblade range, you can still jump and shoot some fires at him if you're trying to get this done quickly. Like before, when he slams his fist into the ground, climb up his arm and combo his head so you can avoid the shadows. More often than not, your swings will parry the raining energy balls, so they're not too much of a concern. Once he's done with that, you'll have a little time to get some combos on his hands and launch some more jumping fires. Then he'll kneel down to do his big chest bursting move, and for that I would just go to the hand farthest away from where the shadows are, and then get behind his wrist and do air combos. Even when Dark Side's dying and things start to go slow motion, keep hitting to build up your MP as you carry it over into Ansem 2. Ansem 2 is tricky, but he's one of my favorite level 1 fights because it's really tense but still totally doable. Ansem has four moves he can use during his first phase. There's his big energy blast move, that travels along the ground, there's a simple low swipe attack from the Guardian, there's Submit, and there's his charge attack, which is probably the most dangerous. For starters, you really want to stay on top of him for the most part, as long as he's reasonably in range, just bust out the combos. Even when he pulls up the Guardian in front of him, dodge roll around back and you can get some free hits on him. Sometimes he'll retaliate with that low swipe attack, so keep that in mind. If Phantom is far away from you, he has more options, and you're going to have to make a judgment call on whether or not you want to approach him to put pressure on him, or let him use one of these options so he doesn't intercept you when you're trying to approach. If he does a little jump backwards, he's preparing to do something and I usually back off so I don't get caught in whatever he's about to do. The energy blast move is easily avoided by just running or rolling to the side, but you can't really challenge it. If Anthem says take this, he's going for his charge move, which can really mess you up if you're not prepared. This move will always be four charges, and Anthem will try and fake you out on the fourth charge. So dodge roll, dodge roll, dodge roll, dodge roll, pause, dodge roll. You basically have to get comfortable with dealing with this move if you want to get through the fight. If you get hit by any one of these charges, it's crucial that you wait until he's done charging to heal yourself, because he can and will kill you if you try to do it in between his attacks. Also, the closer you are to the walls of the arena when this move comes out, the better chance it's going to cause trouble for you. Ansem can kind of get stuck on the walls and throw off your timing, so try to move toward the center of the room when the move starts up. While this attack can be scary, it also gives you a parry opportunity if you jump up and swing at him as he's charging at you. This will stun him a bit, and you can turn the tables on him this way. I tend to try to do this on his third charge after dodge rolling out of the way for the first two. If he starts up his charge attack and you're right on him, you might be able to just parry it immediately if you're already trying to combo him. As for submit, keep in mind that the move has a deceptively longer reach than it appears. Ideally, you'll want to just dodge roll away or jump out of reach, but it often manages to get you by surprise. This is where Strike Raid can be useful. Strike Raid gives you invincibility as long as it's active, and this will protect you from both the Guardian's possession attacks and Ansem's energy shield. It might not last you the entire duration of the submit move, but it can save you a lot of MP as opposed to using Cure every time you get hit. If you can't or don't want to use Strike Raid here, I recommend just dodge rolling for your life until it's over, as sometimes the Guardian will come up for an attack while you're rolling. Once Ansem gets damaged enough to start doing his super move in the middle where he says my strength returns, just run and dodge roll around him. You'll want to hit square as soon as you see the blue pool forming below you and just keep doing that until it's over. You might need to use one of your items during this fight, but I would recommend trying to use no more than one as you'll want at least two on hand for the final gauntlet. So, World of Chaos Anthem is really, really annoying, and overall just not a very fun fight. Donald and Goofy are gone, so you're all on your own, and it's a pretty dangerous environment, and there's no summoning to circumvent any of it. Starting off, you'll probably want to let Anthem get off two of his big swinging attacks before you approach him. As soon as it's safe, get off a combo and then back up to avoid his next attack. From here, you just need to use fire like it's going out of style. What sucks is that fire pushes you back a bit, so you might need to readjust in the middle of your assault. Basically, you need to be far away enough so you're out of range of his attacks, but close enough so the fires still connect. You probably want to be behind him and to his side a bit for your best odds in retrospect. Before your MP is depleted, Anthem is going to start up a laser attack, and he'll always preface that by saying one of two things. If he says, Welcome the darkness into your heart, Welcome the darkness basically keep firing up until he says heart, upon which you want to start flying away. You'll have to avoid two sets of lasers, and you can just continuously fly to the left or right and come out unscathed more often than not. After those lasers end, get back to Ansem and start using fire again. If Ansem says all shall be extinguished, 
really want to get out of there right around when he says B, as the lasers come in a lot earlier this time. This round will be six single lasers with a delay between the fifth and the sixth because Ansem is a dick who likes to fake you out. Just like the charge attack from Ansem 2, if you get hit by the lasers, you should really wait until they're over before stopping to heal. If Ansem summons the Bit Sniper Heartless, you really don't want to deal with them, so just fly far away until they despawn. Basically, so long as there aren't any Bit Snipers or lasers, you want to be launching fireballs into Ansem's ripped abdomen. Ansem's big move in this fight is prefaced by him saying, Still confused? Then perhaps this will enlighten you. I don't know, it's not very good, but I tried. Still confused? Then perhaps this will enlighten you. While he's talking, you can basically keep casting fire for the entirety of the line, and even for like a split second after he's done talking. Ideally, you'll kill him before he can start the next attack, which really sucks. It's just like a seemingly endless stream of lasers, and every time you think it's over, it starts back up. You just need to wait it out and try to close in on Ansem and get some more fires off before they start back up again. You wanna know what's really tragic? I was one away from killing him, and then I had to spend like a minute flying around like a dumbass when he just needed one more fire to go down. It's sadder than the ending of days, really. You can and likely will need to use one or two of your items here, but that's alright if you stock Donald and Goofy up with stuff, and they're about to get back in the mix. Before that, though, you need to take out this room core full of shadows, and this is the first part that I'd recommend using Aroga for. It keeps the shadows off your back, and you can just handle all of them with ground combos. I should mention, it actually behooves you to purposefully die after each phase of World Chaos, as there's no penalty beyond restarting the phase, but your HP and MP will be refilled. The last thing you have to do on your own is take out the artillery, which is really, really annoying if you don't have Aroga active. What makes matters worse, the small artillery are very awkwardly placed, and your Keyblade will often get deflected off of the gross piece of flesh that they're on. Focus on the big artillery first and consider using fire or gravity spam on them, but save enough MP for cure. When the giant guardian uses the wind blast to knock you back, if you need to heal, wait until the laser spawns, as if you're floating still, it'll just snipe you while you're trying to cure. Once there's only a few artillery left, you don't really need to worry about keeping your Aroga up. Once that's done, you're in a room with Goofy and a bunch of dark balls, another crazy Saturday night. Just go nuts with gravity here, and if you run low on MP, Goofy will have a mega elixir or elixir for you. For the record, if you're ever in need of item attention from your party members and they're leaving you hanging, lock off of whatever enemy you're focused on and press try. This will draw your party members' attention to you, and they're a lot more likely to use their items on you, and this goes for Donald as well with healing. The phase can be annoying, he's kind of like Ursula with the constant barrage of lightning bolts. I tend to go for damage towards fire spam, as if you want to do combos, you need to really time it right and move out of the way between each finisher, or else risk getting struck by lightning. It's a lot safer to go for two hit combos and move around in between if you want to go with physical attacks. Even so, with the fire spam, you still need to weave in and out of the lightning bolt, typically after every two fires. If you're running low on MP for fire, save some MP to cure a likely dead Goofy who can hopefully hook you up with a Mega Elixir or Elixir, and remember to get back when the face tilts his head up as he's about to do a big energy shield attack. For some reason, I lost all of my footage for the invisible room and the main core, but the strategy here is the exact same as the Dark Balls. Just go all out with gravity, and this time Donald is there to heal you with both cure and any items he still may have if you need it. As for the main core, you can cast a Roga if you really want to, but a couple of air combos on the main core in the middle will finish it off pretty quickly. Now, it just wouldn't be fitting if the final boss of the game wasn't just a total laughing stock. Wait for Ansem to finish swinging around to get your opening for an air combo, then fly around back to land on solid ground, and just like Chernabog, make sure Donald and Goofy are healthy, summon Mushu, and defend China's honor right in Ansem's big dumb face. Now you know why Mushu acts like such hot shit when you reunite with him in KH2. He's pretty useless on a normal playthrough, but the level 1 run is canon. He killed Ansem and the devil himself, practically single-handedly. He's easily in contention for MVP of the run. With that, all that's left are the remaining 4 super bosses. If you're skipping around, I already covered Phantom, and you can check the description for the timestamp. I'm gonna go in order of what I consider to be easiest to hardest, starting off with Kurt Zisa, who I think is actually easier than a lot of what you have to deal with in End of the World. The way I see it, you've got two options for Kurt Zisa, safe and long, or riskier but short. Kurt Zisa's gimmick is that he can lock you out of using magic or summons, which is especially dangerous because you'll be unable to use cure until you break his two orbs and get access to magic again. However, for the safe method, you can just spawn Tinkerbell at the very start of the fight before the curse kicks in. Tink will heal you at a pretty fast rate, and it's tough for Kurt Zisa to get three hits on you before Tinkerbell can get a cure off. So with this, you can pretty much do the fight as you normally would, attacking the orbs, getting combos when he's vulnerable, and then spamming magic on him when he's got his big shield up. And for that, I'd recommend fire or thunder spam. The only real danger here is when he starts doing his big vertical and horizontal spin moves, as he can get you quick enough to outspeed Tinkerbell's healing, but you could still survive if you bring some high potions and mega potions. As for the second method, you're not going to summon Tink at the start, and instead just try to take out the orbs without accruing much damage. It's alright to take some hits before taking out the first one, as the HP balls it drops are substantial enough to get you back to full health. After the second one, make sure Donald and Goofy are active, get off a finisher if you haven't already, and bring out either Dumbo or Mushu. These guys are both great because they can do a crap ton of damage, but their attacks also still constitute as magic. So after using them while Kurzisa is vulnerable, you can still keep them active when he pulls up his big shield and use them to damage that. As soon as as either of your summons end, get your cursor hovering over the other and summon him right when Donald and Goofy are back on the field. You should have more than enough time 
command MP to take him out during his next window of vulnerability, but if you don't for whatever reason, you might be able to use Genie after that, though I haven't tried it with him. Up next is Ice Titan, and here's where the super bosses start to get pretty difficult. There really isn't too much you can do to cheese this, and yes, you do have to hit the icicles back without guard, which will almost definitely take some getting used to. There is a little bit we can do to lighten the load, however. Go into the fight with full elixirs and fire and gravity on your shortcuts, and start off by avoiding the first wave of icicles and getting close to the Ice Titan. They'll probably want to circle around him a bit instead of making a beeline for him. When you get near his feet, lock onto his head and start jumping and spamming gravity on it. You might get hit by his stomping shockwaves, but with some tricky timing you can't avoid them. Typically I tend to use all of my MP doing this, then I get onto the stands, pop an elixir, and use one or two more gravities. This will put Ice Titan in his vulnerable state, which will save you a whole round of icicle blocking. Here I get off an air combo and then get back onto the stands and fire spam him. Fire can still reach him even when he stands back up, and you only need to stop when he tilts his head back and starts shooting out more icicles. So here's where we're basically out of tricks. We need to deflect the icicles back at him, and without guard that requires some very finicky positioning and timing. Unlike in a normal run where the straight lines of icicles are what you want, in this case we want those horizontal spreads. I would recommend getting up on the stands near any of the four corners, but not so close to the corner that the camera is suffocating you. We want Sora to do a specific keyblade swing where he swings it horizontally from left to right. So in terms of placement for deflecting, you want to be to the right of any oncoming icicles and swing, and you can hit a bunch of them all at once. It's going to be frustrating, you're likely going to get hit by either the icicles or whatever the Ice Titan does next, and it's going to suck. Just keep cured up and keep at it. You should keep in mind that whenever he's shooting out icicles, your best opportunity to deflect is typically going to be on the last ones in that set. Alright, now let's talk about the other attacks in this phase. The first is one he'll use during the first phase while you're spamming gravity on him, and that's the ice stalagmites that come up from the ground. It's always six of them every time he does it, and you can jump up and glide when he starts and count for six noises of them shooting up. Though this can be risky in the third phase when he starts to do this in conjunction with his next attack, which are the big blue snowballs that he drops on you. But for now, these always come in threes, and you can either just run in one direction or dodge roll before each one drops. Lastly, if you walk or land on the floor after he uses his ice breath attack, Sora will fall over like a helpless grandma. There's no rush to get up from this, as you're actually invincible from any other attack while you're sitting, and even for a second or so after you're standing back up, so wait that out before moving again for as long as you can. Also, if you need to heal, always, always jump up and towards the arena, not up the stands, because you can get sniped by one of the floor icicles if you're too close to the ground. I actually don't do this too much in my successful run, and from watching the footage back, it could have made things a lot easier for me in a couple of scenarios. Keep deflecting icicles wherever you can until you get them knocked over again. If you want, you can go in for another air combo for damage storage fire, or just do fires right off the bat, since they do deal double damage in the first place. Your window of attack when he's in this state gets shorter and shorter as you get him closer to death, so keep that in mind. Also, now might be a good time to use an elixir if you're hurting for MP. This is the last phase, and things get kind of crazy here. After getting back up, he's gonna shoot out a bunch of icicles, and he'll drop three single snowballs on you while that's happening. If you're in the center of the stands when this starts, you can just run to either end of the stands to avoid all of that. Ice Titan is gonna follow this up with his big freezy move called Diamond Dust, and you just need to be off to the side of him to avoid that. If you get caught right in the middle of it from when it starts, that's pretty much game over. Afterwards, if he did that move on the opposite side of the stands or in the center, he's gonna stomp a few times as he turns to you, and so long as he's stomping, snowballs are gonna keep dropping, so stay moving while he turns. You're gonna have to pay a lot of attention to his patterns now so you know when you're safe to heal and when you need to be moving. I'm gonna put the patterns on screen here. Get it memorized. Get it memorized. Get it memorized. After his first diamond dust, he shoots icicles, and then he slams his hand into the ground, which signals the six ice spears from the floor, and from now on there are going to be two snowballs thrown in there while that move is active. After that, he throws icicles again, and then ice breath. Every time he finishes blowing on an ice breath, a snowball drops at the end, so you need to be ready to dodge that. After ice breath, he goes into another diamond dust, and just like the ice breath, right when diamond dust is wrapping up, he drops another snowball. After that, he gives you another burst of icicles, and then goes into a second diamond dust, and then the cycle repeats. The most dangerous move, in my opinion, is the ground spears with the snowballs at the same time, if you get hit and are in critical health at any point during this attack, I encourage you to wait until it's over because you want to stay in motion and if you're on the ground or in the air, you're vulnerable if you stop to cure. Ideally, the best time to heal or use an item would be right when he's starting up Diamond Dust. So long as you're out of range, you're pretty much completely safe, you just need to be ready to dodge the snowball that drops when it's finished. As for the icicles, they always come out the same way in this phase. When the icicles just teleport out from him, I typically don't bother with those ones. When Ice Titan himself shoots them out after moving his hand, it's always going to be a straight line of them followed by two sets of horizontally spread ones. It's one of these two sets that you want to hit. The first spread is going to be easier to hit, but you're likely to get hit by the next spread when you're done. If you go for the second spread, you'd have to avoid the first one, and if you connect, you might still get hit by whatever move Ice Titan is about to do next. Basically, you're going to eat shit, but you get to choose if you want it for lunch or dinner. I tend to go for the first of the two horizontal spreads. That's about all there is to it. It's incredibly frustrating, and most of it comes down to you just learning the patterns and learning how to react to certain moves. My successful run of the fight here took me about six and a half minutes, so it's one of the longer ones. Winning gets you the Diamond Dust Keyblade, which you might as well put on, since it gives you some extra MP. 
Up next is Unknown, which actually might be easier than Ice Titan, but I had never done this fight or Sephiroth on level 1 prior to making this video. So initially, I tried to just gravity spam on the guy, and that seemed to get me decently far, but he would always trap me in the move where he messes with your command menu, which is practically a death sentence. So the goal is to avoid that move, and for the life of me, I couldn't figure it out, so I had to look this one up from someone who's already dealt with this. This strategy is entirely credited to WillJV2, and I'll link his video in the description. I don't know if he was the first to use it, but he made the video I saw that employs this strat, and it works really well. If you remember the strategy we used to to get Riku 2 stuck in place, this is similar except there's a lot more moving parts. Basically, in order to avoid that awful electricity move, we need Donald and Goofy out of our way. When the battle starts, we want to wait until Unknown uses any of the moves that isn't the lightsaber. Until he uses either his wall attack or the big energy balls, just dodge roll away. Once he uses either of those moves, summon Simba or Genie. I like to go with Simba to start and I'll explain why later. Once he's summoned, I'd stand still for like a second and examine your surroundings. Basically, objects in the overhead compartment may have shifted while the summon animation was playing. It usually happens if you summon during the ball move, Unknown will move around a bit and he might surprise you by being on the other side of you when you come out of the animation. We didn't summon Simba to use him, but rather to get Donald and Goofy out of the field. Simba's just here to chill. With Simba out, the strategy here is to wait for either of the two attacks that we were looking for at the start. When he does one of them, you want to use a mid-air gravity on him. If it works, he'll be stunned, which he shows by contorting a bit and sparking with blue electricity. At this point, close in on him and get off a combo. Now, depending on how quickly you get to him, you can hit him up to five times with a one-two and then a full combo, but you'll generally be farther away from him with the first time you stun him, so I play it safe and just go for a one followed by a 3 or just a regular 3 hit combo. Now here's where the strategy really starts. After a finisher, regardless of how many times you hit him, he's going to do a little flip jump backwards and then use the ball move. As he's jumping back and starting his ball attack again, you want to do a small jump backwards too and then use a minor gravity on him, stunning him again. This is all happening pretty quickly, but after landing from that gravity, you need to do a big jump over the energy balls and close in on him to hit him again. Now my big roadblock here when I was starting was that I was always getting caught in the attack when trying to jump over and I think it was because the jump I was using to cast gravity was too high and so I was landing later, thus getting caught in the blast when trying to jump over. So for me, it helped to do a much smaller jump before using gravity, and I would visualize it as Sora just barely jumping over Simba, who's almost always going to be right behind you. It's like the perfect height and distance away from Unknown, and it'll set you up to clear the jump over the energy balls. Now, what I try to do is hit him with my first swing as I'm landing from the big jump over the balls, and then follow up with a combo. From there, you rinse and repeat. Finisher, small jump back with gravity, big jump over the orbs, combo and finisher, repeat. It's probably going to take a while to get into the rhythm, but once you do, it's pretty much foolproof. If for whatever reason it takes you longer to get to him, or you you get clipped by one of the energy balls, don't get greedy with your attack. If you've been doing 5 or 4 hits, just get off the 3 hit combo and keep the cycle going. One thing I'd recommend is trying to keep him away from the walls as you can mess up your spacing and knock him out of the loop. When landing your finisher, try to orient yourself so that you're knocking him towards the center or at least away from the nearest wall. If you do mess up the cycle and he uses another move, you can still get him back into it but it'll probably take a while. You have to wait for him to use the wall or the balls again and as you get further along, he'll start to use a much longer lightsaber attack as well as his blue lasers, both of which you can just run and dodge roll away from. But trying to get him back into the loop, however, wastes away at your summon gauge, so you might just want to soft reset and try again. Keep him in the loop until he rises into the air and starts shooting energy beams out of his body. At this point, Simba has probably either run out or ran out a few seconds ago. Regardless, dismiss him, and hopefully Donald and Goofy can use an elixir on you when they're back in the mix. As Unknown is doing his big energy attack, you can either strike rate him until it's over, or try to dodge roll and super glide away, but that's obviously much harder. Right when he's wrapping that up, you want to make sure everyone's alive so you can summon Genie. Unknown is going to start shooting orange lasers, which you just want to run in a straight line left or right to avoid, and eventually he'll follow up with a really long lightsaber attack. The first time, you just want to dodge roll away from it. The second time, however, you want to dodge roll away for almost all of it, but start gliding as he finishes up. While you're in the air, cast gravity on him. The timing here is tricky, but it's your best opportunity to get him back into the loop. As soon as you get him locked back in, the fight is exactly the same as it was when you had Simba out. I can't imagine trying to do this fight without this strategy, so big props to Will for the great video on how to carry this out. It's probably going to take you a few tries to get the hang of the timing and positioning, but once you learn it and get into the groove, it's really not all that bad. Alright, so here's the granddaddy of super bosses, Sephiroth. Load up on elixirs and google some therapists. There's a few things you should know about Sephiroth. First is that he's a total asshole. Sometimes Sephiroth just doesn't feel like getting hit and decides to eviscerate you with gigantic flame pillars. You're going to get punished and more than half the time you just have to take your lumps, run away, and cure like a little baby. I'll let you know up top, I died a lot getting the footage for this and while I feel like I've got a grasp on how to do it now, I'd probably die quite a few more times if I had to do it again. It's by far the hardest fight level one has to offer. I'm not going to tell you how to do it and pretend that I'm a pro and that this fight isn't sometimes complete bullshit, I probably died somewhere around 80 or 90 times, so I am with you in solidarity. In his first phase, Sephiroth has three moves, a simple horizontal slash from a standing position, which is going to be our favorite. His other sword attack right now is an annoying move where he slashes while jumping forward and then jumping back to his starting position. You're going to need to get used to that one as your window for attacking right now is going to be after he finishes either of those slash moves. With the jump slash, don't pay attention to where he's going, stay focused on where he started before he jumped and be ready to meet him 
him there with a combo. His other move he has right now is Flame Pillars, which are just a shit ton of ass. After every combo you get on him, Sephiroth will either retaliate with Flame Pillars or Slash followed directly by Flame Pillars. This is incredibly dangerous to get stuck in, and while you can dodge roll out and only take one hit from it, you're more often than not going to receive two hits if you're caught in it. For this reason, you want to try and always be fully healed, as he can also sometimes use the pillars unpredictably and catch you by surprise, and that can be death if you're already one hit down. Also, he'll use them if he gets impatient with you. If you haven't landed a hit on him in a while, he'll use it right after a slash attack, so if you've been unable to get an opening for a bit, try to bait the flame pillars out before trying to sincerely approach him again. Okay, starting off, Sephiroth can and will smack you in the face if you don't immediately back up or jump, so do either and then get an air combo on him. You're always going to approach him in this phase by baiting out a slash attack by jumping over him and then getting an air combo. So here's order of operations. Jump over a slash, combo, wait for him to do flame pillars, jump over a slash, combo, wait for him to do flame pillars again. After two full combos, Sephiroth starts acting like a brat and will retaliate the next time you hit him. Now sometimes you can avoid this retaliation and sometimes it's flame pillars and you just have to take it. If you're lucky, he'll do a teleport slash and you can dodge roll out of range. So on this third round of offense, approach him knowing you'll only hit him once and then after that first hit, your best bet is to just dodge roll and hope that it's not flame pillars. If it is, still dodge roll away and jump up and heal. In general, dodge roll is crucial for this fight and you should probably do one or two after every action, land a combo or heal and then dodge roll away because you're going to be left open if you don't. This might be in my head, but I found that if you dodge roll to your left or right, you're more likely to avoid getting slashed after he teleports. Your instinct will probably tell you to dodge roll backwards and away, but Sephiroth usually catches you since he's slashing in that direction. So regardless of where Sora is, be ready to tilt your left stick to the right or left and dodge roll in anticipation of that retaliation attack. After that retaliation, you just go back to your air combos. It's a bit tedious, but it's the safest way to do it. After every two combos, he's going to retaliate, so be ready. That's all there is to the first phase. The second start of the phase is signaled by Sephiroth doing a big boy jump, and then he says come, and gives you a creepy come hither hand gesture. While he's doing that, you can close in on him for a combo, but keep in mind he can still retaliate if that's where you are with him during your hit cycle. Regardless, in phase two, Sephiroth starts running around, and now you belong to him. At the start of the phase, he's gonna run directly towards you. The first time he does this is always a bluff, so don't bother reacting. He'll teleport away for a really scary move. Some people call it Descend Heartless Angels. Some people think he's saying Sin Harvest, but he's obviously saying Steve Harvey's Angels. Obviously, the last thing you want is for him to get this move off, so you need to super glide over to him and combo him, otherwise you'll drop down to 0 MP and 1 HP, and at that point I would just reset because you want to save your elixirs and you can't really afford to use any on recovering from that. Now keep in mind his retaliation rules are still in play, but one of your best chances to get damage on him during this phase is when you're interrupting Steve Harvey's angels. Regardless of whether or not you get off a full combo or he retaliates, things are about to get hectic. Sephiroth is just going to start running at and around you, sometimes teleporting, and basically you just need to curl up into a ball and dodge roll away. You have a couple of openings here for damage, but they're not going to be as safe as Steve Harvey. If he jumps and happens to land right next to you, you can take advantage of that for a combo. If he's running in circles around you, I wouldn't bother trying to attack as your hits probably won't connect and he'll just counter attack you. However, when he runs straight towards you, he has a chance of attacking with a horizontal slash, which you can treat just like the ones in the first phase. Keep in mind though, he can bluff you and either teleport or jump away or sometimes even use flame pillars. I'd recommend trying to take advantage of this opening, otherwise you might end up running out of MP from curing if you only use the Steve Harvey attack as an opening. Now after getting a few hits on him in this phase, he's going to start prepping a really scary attack called Octo Slash, which is cued by him saying a line in the screen getting darker. Honestly, it's lame, but the best way to deal with this is to just run toward him and press triangle to strike raid. When doing it, try to press triangle later rather than sooner during the follow-up attacks because you want to stay invincible for the duration of the move. It's possible to avoid this attack by jumping and dodge rolling, but it's really difficult. After this move, Sephiroth always follows up with a Steve Harvey, so be ready to chase him down. Keep in mind, at this point, your MP is probably low or empty, so you need to try and find an opportunity to use an item. If he doesn't teleport too far away to use Steve Harvey, you can probably pop an elixir and still have time to interrupt him, but in general, your best time to heal or use an item is going to be while he's using flame pillars. Regardless, you want to try and always have 2 MP available for strike raid because you'll need to do it a few times before moving on to phase 3. Keep this up and take advantage of your openings and eventually Sephiroth will teleport around a few times and end up in the center of the arena. If you want, you can get close to him right now and get some damage on him when he starts going blue. Phase 3 is, no surprise, incredibly scary. Whenever the blue energy balls are in play, you just want to dodge roll away from them. Very early on in this phase, Sephiroth is going to use his meteor attack. As the meteors start falling, you want to try and be gliding so you don't get hit by the shockwaves. As they start to circle around the arena, I like to hug one of the walls and try to dodge roll as they come toward me, but I'm clearly not too good at that. You can avoid the big final energy blast by dodge rolling into it at the right time, but it's pretty tricky. I think you can also glide up and sort of over it or through it, but I haven't tried it myself. In this phase, I recommend only going into attack at two opportunities. The more common one is when Sephiroth lands from his spinny aerial attack where he says dodge this. You want to air combo him right after he lands from doing that, and I mean you should really make sure his feet are on the ground, otherwise you'll move in too early and get hit by the end of the attack. Your other opportunity for damage is less common but safer. Sephiroth will do his Steve Harvey attack in this phase, and sometimes he'll do it a few times in a row. You also have to bear in mind that he'll still retaliate as normal like he did in phases 1 and 2, so it's all easier said than done. Sephiroth will still do 
Psycho Slash in this phase, and he can still do his Meteor Attack again, so be ready to deal with those, and don't hesitate to use your Elixirs whenever you're low on MP. All in all, just dodge roll around and take your hits when you can get them. Steer clear of the blue energy orbs, and don't fall for the bait when he says come, he's just spawning more orbs that'll likely hit you. It sucks, it's tense, and it's probably gonna take you a billion tries, as it did for me, but once you did it, you can stand up, look yourself in the mirror, and finally say, what am I doing with my life? And that's that guys, my Kingdom Hearts level 1 guide. Clearly this has been my biggest project so far, both in getting the footage and in scripting and editing, so I really hope you enjoyed it and that it could be useful to you. Like I said up top, I'm no master, but hopefully these strategies can get you through these fights, and if you have any questions about anything in particular, I am always responding to the comments. At the end of the day, it's a self-imposed challenge with no reward beyond the satisfaction of just doing it, so however you choose to get it done is really all that matters. This was a big old labor of love, and I'd really appreciate it if you could drop a like and consider subscribing if you're new, it would really just make my gosh dang goddamn day. As always, I've got stuff planned for the future, and I promise that follow-up to the Obscure KH1 video will be out relatively soon. For now, you can check out the original right here. That's a wrap for me today. I've got to go listen to literally any song that isn't One Winged Angel. As a wise man once said, Goodbye.